it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Sing the songs of Zion. Express our faith in God. And God is faithful to us. Appreciate all the words of faith. And trusting in God. Believing in God. You know, that's... Uh, that's our hope, isn't it? That God will take care of us. And we want God to take care of our loved ones. And if it's possible, he will. Uh, the possibility, what hinders any poss possibility of not doing it, is what uh, someone said about, uh, maybe it was Sabrina, or Kathy Sue said, God can help you if you'll respond to him. It's a matter of responding to God. There's a way of raising children, and you do your best you can to talk to them and, and uh, plant faith in their hearts. Tell them what God has done for you, and Mama, tell them what he did for their their grandparents and their great grandparents and people that we know that had a relationship with God. How God delivered in time of sorrow and sickness and death and sadness and in poverty. Uh, I've heard so many testimonies, Sister Alice, through the years of how um, God provided. When there wasn't any jobs, a job would open up. They'd get a, buy a book and open it up and a $20 bill on the inside. Um, driving down the street and somebody throw money out in front of them. You pull over and a $20 bill rolled off to the side of the road. God does provide. And it's good to rehearse those things. To let your children know that God is a provider. There's something about faith and unbelief that exists in people. How God can just reach down in a family of, of, of nine or ten people and just pull one out that they've got faith. But that means the other eight or nine didn't have faith. Without faith, it's impossible to serve God. It's impossible to believe in God. And elders asked me at different times, said, how come one person serves the Lord and another person doesn't serve the Lord? Well, it has to do with that, their heart and their soul and their faith. And when they hear about God, they just believe, and they want to seek God. We become God seekers. I would that we could get more people to be God seekers. And if you're a God seeker, you're a truth seeker. You want to uh, search for truth, because that's really what helps save us, is the facts about God. There's a story that Christ told in Luke, uh, the 15th chapter. It's got some beautiful um, types and shadow in it, but it's, it's also a story about a man that had two sons. And one of them had a heart to stay at home with the father and, and serve the father. And the other had a heart not to stay with him. Someone mentioned it last night. In the 11th verse, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that befalleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. 
You know, after that, everything that he had belonged to the elder son. He gave the younger son his inheritance. And thus they were joint heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. My understanding of a joint heir, if two, two people inherit $100,000 and one of them spends 70000 the 30000 that's left is still part of his as long as there's money left. They can spend it. That's a joint heir, as long as there's something there. But just as an heir, if it was 100000 it would split it in half, and apparently it looked like they split it in half and give the young man what his, what his inheritance was, and the other one, everything belonged to him. This story, as it goes, it was Shay that mentioned it last night. Do you know that the, the older son... And the younger son, neither one of them knew the father. It's sad to not have a relationship and know God. And uh, if we don't know God, how in the world can we introduce people to God? How can we draw people to God if we don't know God? Lord, help us to know you. Help us to understand you. Help us to be able to comprehend the facts about God. What kind of person God is? Well, he's a good person. It was said today that God loves everybody. Well, sure. He said he causes it to rain on the just and the unjust. Everybody gets his love. The rain is... is uh, God loving humanity. Without rain, we'd die. You go out and live in a desert for a while. You won't last long. But God lets it rain enough that there's fertile ground to grow food. And there's water to drink. And that's for everybody. Love is an action. And God proves it. He loves everyone. But they don't all love him back. Matter of fact, some of them don't even say, thank you, God. And there's a lot that say there is no God. Uh, this world just exists on its own. It just come about, you know, through a process of, of evolution. And seeds started growing, and the air started being made, and, you know, it all, it all come about uh, just on its, by itself. But it said, God created the heaven and the earth. For us to know that God is there. And that, that uh, he can help us. One of the hardest things to help people with is mental illness. And Jesus had uh, the disciples come to him. And they said, Master, said, we've got a guy here and we've prayed for him. And... We can't do anything. We can't, we can't get anywhere with him. And Jesus said, this kind only comes out through prayer and fasting. And they called mental illness back in that day. They didn't comprehend it. They, they, they didn't know what it was. Why would somebody throw themselves in a fire and in the water? And why would they do this? And so they thought it was evil spirits. Knock on wood. And... That very term, knock on wood, that was a term I guess the Irish had, had and, and uh, they'd knock on wood to run evil spirits out of their house. <laughs> like knocking on wood would do anything, but that was just an old saying. Jesus healed the man. But how many people with illness, mental illness did he not heal? The day will come when nobody will have mental illness. But today that we live in, it's a, it's a sad commentary for our society that there is so much of it, Mama. It just seemed like I, maybe it was always there, but I never 
seen it as bad as it is now. And it's possible, Ed, be, it's because there are just so many people. And, and uh, someone said something one time, and it kind of made sense to me. If you got an original copy of something, and you ran a Xerox of that, copy it, and then you copy the copy, and then you copy that copy, and then you copy that copy, and you do that several million times, you take the original and hold it up to that, it don't look the same. And through the creative process of man, as men begot men and children, there's a breakdown, it looks like, of the, what would you call it, the genetic makeup. And it causes all kind of problems, physical and mental problems. God can fix it, but God doesn't fix everybody. He'll fix his children. God helps his children. When, when there is a benefit in serve the, serving the Lord, bless the Lord, O oh my, oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. There's benefits in serving God. A child, when it is un, in the, before the age of accountability, uh, it, uh, it's under the covering of the parents. Something happens to it. There's a resurrection for that child. We have scripture on it. God will help them. But at, at the age of accountability, then a, a child becomes a, a man or a woman. The responsibility from God then is not the covering of the parents. It's that child's relationship with God. That's why it's so important if we can possibly, Sister Lawanda, plant something down on the inside of little Peyton, these little ones, that when they get older, it'll take hold. I grew up in church. Mom and Daddy wasn't going then. Uh, uh, Grandma and Grandpa would bring me and Ed, and, and, and then later on Kathy Sue, and uh, there was something planted down on the inside of me that when I turned at 12 years old, I chose to serve God. Now, that was my choice. But if I had not chose to serve God, I'd just be another uh, nameless individual out in the world not having my name in the book of life, not, not, being, not having a, a relationship with God. It's not enough for a grandparent to have a relationship or a mom and dad to have a relationship. Every individual must have their own relationship with God. That means you talk to him, you believe in him. You ask him for help. You ask him for guidance. Majority of people's problems is bad decisions. Bad decisions leads to another bad decision, to another bad decision. And we ask God to help us make good decisions. Yes. It's important. Uh, it's important to make a decision of what you're going to do in life. What kind of occupation? You know, someone said, you can do whatever you want to. And some guy come up, and he's old and crippled, and he said, I want to be a, I want to be a, a, a pole vaulter. Well, he ain't going to be no pole vaulter. He barely can walk. So you have to pick out something that you can do, and then God leads you into it, and help you get a career. It's important who you marry. If you marry the wrong individual, heaven on earth can be hell on earth. 
and it can cause all kind of problems. How are you going to divide your time up? Does God get any? Does God get any time? Teach your children, uh, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Give God his due. God gives you 24 hours a day. Give him something back. Give him, he give you a mind. Give part of your mind to him. But if you just want to have all your time for you, all your, everything the way you want it, it won't turn out like you think it will. You know, a person can sit down and plan their whole life out, but it just don't go like you sit down and plan. You'll hit problems in life, and Jesus is there to help you through it, or to turn you Turn, turn you a different direction. You're going one way and all, all of a sudden you feel the Holy Ghost unction you. I tell you what, it's so valuable to have the Holy Ghost and be able to hear God talk to you. If you're saved, you can hear God talk to you. He'll say, don't do that. Don't do that. I heard an Egyptian... In a meeting years ago, I think it was in Houston, Texas, he was a tour guide in, in Israel. And Christian groups had come over. Well, he wasn't no Christian. He wasn't a Jew. He wasn't a Jewish. He, he was an atheist. And, and he got just upset with life and decided to co take his life, commit suicide. He drunk a bunch of poison. Just a little bit was killed a man. He took enough to kill several men. He said he didn't die. He said, and then I knew there was a God. So I started talking to some of them Christians I was taking around, and they told me about the Lord. And he said, I got the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. But he said, I didn't know how to serve God. And he said, I went to a place that I always, always went to. And he said, I got to the door and something said, uh-uh, don't go in there. He said, I just felt that on the inside. And he said, I thought, well, what in the world's that? I go here all the time. And he said, I pushed by that. Later on, he said, I went again. He said, uh-uh, don't go in there. He went on in. After a while, he said, uh-uh, don't go in there. He said, and after a while, I didn't hear nothing, didn't feel nothing. Bad. Got into some more problems. He said, I found out as a Christian I shouldn't be going in there. But nobody told me. Wasn't a part of no church. Eventually got to be with a group of Christians. Found out there are some things Christians do and some things Christians don't do. And he didn't know the difference. Some things, if you do everything that the world does, you're going to be just like the world. Christians don't live like ungodly people. If they do, they have ungodly problems. They got all the problems that the ungodly have. And the finality of it is the payday. Payday someday. They get paid what ungodly get paid. Well, I don't want the ungodly pay. Their pay is not any good. It's death. But this young man made a decision. It's a picture of God. And, and uh, the Jew and the Gentiles, what it's a picture of. But he said, I want my inheritance. You know, it's a sad thing to raise children and try to plant them in the Lord. And, and I've watched families. I, 
It's amazing. I've seen some of the, the pillars in Paducah, Kentucky. I mean great men and women. Pillars. And they served God their whole life and died serving the Lord. And their kids didn't serve God. Sister Alice, it's no guarantee that children are going to serve the Lord. When I come to that realization, I thought, oh God, how can you, if they couldn't do it, as, as great a people as they are, I mean, it, it, they just served God with everything that was in them. And uh, you'd think their kids would serve God. And they didn't. Train up a child in the way they should go. When they're old, they'll not depart from it. But I've found out that don't always work. You can train them, but if they don't take the training, it don't work. Daddy used to train dogs. He was good at it, but if a dog wouldn't learn, he couldn't train them. As good a, as good a teacher as he was. That's just an animal. You can say, oh, if I'd have did this, if I'd have did that, my kids would have did this and that. That ain't always the case. We do the best we can with them. We pray for them. Counsel with them. Plead with them. Help them uh, in any way we can help them with hope that someday they wake up and take a hold and become Christians. You can grow up in a Christian home and not be a Christian. You can grow up a, in a heathen home and become a Christian. Some of the best Christians in the world come out of ungodly homes. Growing up the way we did, uh, Mom and Daddy wasn't, wasn't going then. That was a period of time that Mama talks about. And they was kids that their Mom and Daddies was in church. You'd, and you'd think, well, they're going to make it. You be lucky if you do. But Ed turned around and a lot of them, not a matter of fact, I think it was the majority, they didn't become Christians. But it was up to the individual. We still hope and pray for our loved ones that no matter how old they get, I always say, as long as there's life, there's hope. As long as there's life, there's hope that God can talk to them and deal with them and turn them around. But another thing is, the older people get, the harder it is to turn around. I was in a meeting one time. A man stood up and he said, how many people found God from 12 years old and under? That big group stood up. Said, how many people found God between uh, 20 years old and 12 years old? And uh, another group stood up. How many people found God from 20 years old to 30 years old? What well, if you stood up and not very many. How many people from 30 years to 40 years old found God? And there's just, there's a handful and the lot higher you got, the less they were. And eventually, how many people found God from 50 to 60 years old? Nobody stood up. There had been people that found God when they was young and didn't serve him for a while and come back, but they found him when they was young. If you don't find God when you're young, it's hard to find God as you get older. 
Because there's something about age, it calls, age without faith destroys faith. It destroys the ability to have faith. Well, I seen somebody come to God and get the Holy Ghost when they was between the 60s and 70s. But if you did an investigation, they found the Lord when they was young. In this case, they did have. They had found the Lord when they were young, and then wasn't until way late in life that they give their heart over to the Lord. There's a window of opportunity from eight years old to to 28 years old. That people's young enough that the world hasn't destroyed them. That they can start to have faith. Faith has got to start somewhere. And it don't start on the top. It starts out just believing there is a God. So he divided unto them his living... And not many days after, the younger man gathered all together. See, he, he, got, he got his part of the inheritance. Then he gathered it all together and took a journey into a far country. He left, he left his home. He left his faith. He left his father. He left God. And he wasted his life. He wasted his substance with riotous living. So the, they think it's strange if you live, live not in the same excess of rioting as they do. That means he just lived an ungodly life, partying, drinking, drugs, well, everything else that goes with it. He was just living it up. And not you you don't live it up, you just you're just using life up and it'll soon be gone. One life and it'll soon be past, and only what's done for Christ will last. And when he had spent all well, thank God he didn't die. Thank God he didn't feel like he was a success. If he felt like, if he'd have doubled his money, tripled his money, got a bigger home than his dad, had all he needed, he'd have felt a success, he'd have never come back. If he'd have died, he'd never come back. But when he had spent all, there arose a great famine in that land. And he began to be in want. He started suffering. He didn't have enough to eat. He wasn't riotous living now. He was just barely making it by. His decisions had caused him to waste his youth. Youth is something you can't buy back. He would wasted his youth. He had wasted his finances. He had wasted his health. Verse 15, Michael. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. He either joined to a, a some kind of religious group or a uh, civil government group but he was seeking help from somebody else other than his father. He joined himself to a citizen. He hired out to work for somebody. And he sent him into his fields to feed the swine. That was pretty low. Coming from being a a prince in his father's house. Now he's a, a servant to some, some ungodly man feeding hogs. 
one decision. He decided to take his living. He decided to leave his home. He decided to live a, an ungodly life. And now he's decided just to exist, to work in a very meager position, a very sad condition. Verse 16, Michael. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk. That's not corn on the cob. <laughs> That's husk. I don't even know how you can eat husk, Ed. I guess you can take a corn cob if it's fresh and chew on it. Get something out of it, Get something out of it if you're starving. That the swines did eat. And no man gave unto him. Nobody gave him anything. Nobody helped him. People, kids go out in the world and they got their buddies and their friends. Well, when the money runs out, the buddy and friends runs out. And before long, they're on their own. They ain't a friend or a buddy. If this guy had a friend anywhere, he'd have fed him. People come around here and knock, they knock on the church door. Said, hey, I need food. I need a place to sleep. Or usually say, I need some money. And you know, they're on drugs or on alcohol or something, you know. I said, well, what about... You got any family? Said, yeah, but they won't have nothing to do with me. The truth is, it's the other way around. If they've got family, they'd help them if they'd go to them, but they don't want nothing to do with them. Said, you got any friends? Yeah, but they're all backstabbers. I thought, well, you ain't got any friends. They're all backstabbers. And I'm thinking... Uh-huh, this guy's a backstabber. He just backstabbed any friend he's got by saying they're backstabber. you got to be careful with those kind of people. Ed. I said, well, what about your church? You don't, your church can't help you? Oh, I don't go to church. I said, you don't have any family, you don't have any friends, and you don't have any church. And no, <clears throat> no, no. What a sad condition that people get in. Besides that, the guy's a liar. He's got somebody somewhere. Grandma, Grandpa. he got, you know, people, they've got a friend somewhere, and, and you get down to the crap. Well, I'm living with my friend over here on the other side of town. They don't, they don't ever tell you the truth. This story is truth. Jesus is telling them about it. He had nobody. Nobody give him anything. Verse 17. When he came to himself, this is the hope that we have, isn't it? Kids can get in really bad shape. You can bail them out and bail them out and bail them out, and they'll just keep going. But nobody bailed this boy out. He had Nobody helped him. Even his father didn't help him. He wouldn't go to his father. If you had asked him, said, you got any family? He said, yeah, but they won't have nothing to do with me. Well, that's because he wouldn't go to him. He, when he came to himself, kind of like he just woke up all of a sudden, like he'd been in a dream, in a coma. He, all of a sudden, it just dawned on him, hey, I've been doing the wrong thing. I've been making bad decisions. How And he thought, how many hired servants of my father's, he could think about all the, the servants in the field, the servants in the house, the servants in the kitchen, and they got bread enough to eat and to spare. They probably throw a few pieces of bread out to the dogs, to the chickens. <clears throat> And I perish with hunger. This is the first time there's hope in this young man's life. 
He's at the bottom. If he never hit bottom, if he kept thinking he was going to do it himself, he had never went home. And he said, and I perish with hunger. I, I miss what I had when I was with Father. Spiritually. Verse 18, Michael. He said, I will arise and go to my father. And I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. You know, if people can come to their senses. There's an old saying, if you can't, if you can't listen, you have to feel. Well, he couldn't listen, and now he's feeling. And he was feeling pretty bad. I've sinned against heaven and against thee, verse 19, Michael, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. He's in a good attitude right now. He's humble. He's seeking a place. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Verse 20. And he arose. See, this is what he was saying in his mind. I'm going to tell dad when I get there. And he came to his father. But when he, he was yet a great way off, his father saw him. He just thought, Dad may kick me out. I'm no longer a son. I got the inheritance and, and throw that all away. And My father don't love me, but maybe he'll let me be a servant. See, he didn't know the father. He didn't know how much God loved him. But his father saw him afar off. And had compassion and ran. <laughs> the old man still had some strength in him. <laughs> he ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. That's the father coming to the son. Draw not to God, he'll draw not to you. Next verse. And the son said unto him, like he planned, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Next verse, Michael. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe. This guy had on rags. He'd been, he'd been feeding hogs and eating with hogs. He had on filthy rags. He said, put it on him. Put a ring on his hand. That was a, a symbol of who he was. And it's also a, a, a symbol of the endless love of God. That circle, that ring. Put shoes on his feet. This guy was... In rags and barefooted and starving. Wonder his dad even recognized him. I'm going to say he wasn't washed up and clean very good and shaved. The next verse. And bring forth the fatted calf. And kill it. And let us eat and be merry. They had a feast. He said, my son that was dead... Is alive. Woo! Thank God they made Mary. <coughs> the son did not expect that. People that go out away from God, they don't expect God to hug them and welcome them back. But God will, and we're to, we're to do it too. If they'll come back, this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost. He was lost in sin. 
He was lost and gone, and he's found. And they began to be merry. Well, yeah, they were rejoicing. Verse 25. Now his eldest son was in the field. He never left. He was there working. The whole time that other one was gone out, he stayed there working. And he said, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. It ought to made him happy. But he didn't know his father either. One left him and didn't know his father. One stayed and didn't know his father. I don't know which one was the worst. Neither one of them knew the father. God help us to know you. Verse 26. And he, this brother, the elder son, called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. What, what's going on here? Why are they killing that calf? What's all this merrymaking that's happening? Verse 27. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come. He should have went, Woohoo! My brother's back home. Thank God. My, thy brother has come, and thy father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him safe and sound. He thought he was dead, thought he was lost, and he's home. The brother should have been happy, and he should have been glad that the father responded in such a way. Verse 28. And the brother was angry. Why? That don't even make sense. The brother was angry and would not go in. I ain't going in there and eating with him. I ain't have nothing to do with that boy. He took his money and left, and I don't know why dad's wasting his time with him. Therefore came his father out. <laughs> See, the father went out and got the one that we left and come back. Now the father went out and got the one that stayed and entreated him, talked to him, explained to him. Next verse, Michael. And he said, answered, saying to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandments. He sounded like he was getting self righteous. And yet thou never gave me a kid. He's talking about a goat. That I might make merry, let alone a fatted calf. With my friends, you, you never give me anything. You, you didn't let me have... This, this guy had on clean clothes, closet full of clothes. He had all of his inheritance still there. He had all the food he wanted to eat. And he's complaining because they made merry over one that was lost. I don't know if you've ever seen that happen in the church, but I've seen people come back into church and other people get mad about it thinking, you shouldn't let them come back in. They've been out there and they've done this and they've done that. What a bad attitude. Next verse, Michael. But as soon as but as soon as this thy son was come, which hast devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. He was bringing accusations against the father for being merciful. Verse 31. And he said unto him, Son, Son, my oldest son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. Your brother done took his inheritance. Everything that I have is thine. Don't you realize how much I love you? Don't you see? See, there's people that get lost in the world. And it's only by the grace of God they make it out. 
and come back into God's house. But there are people who can get lost in the church. It's only by the grace of God that they get out of that condition. And they get to know the Father. We're to know God. We're to love our brothers. We're to love one another. Next verse, Michael. It was meet that we should make merry. I'm only doing what we should do. Be glad, son, for thy brother, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. What a, what a beautiful what a beautiful story. Now you can preach this with revivals of the prodigal son. You can teach this with the imagery of the Jew and the Gentile. There's so many things in it. The manifold wisdom of God. The manifold wisdom of God, Brother Amir said, is like a diamond with a lot of different faces. Every little angle is a facet, a face. And as you turn it, you can see something different. This chapter is like that. But I was just telling you today the story of two brothers and a father. Thank God the young man come home and the father was still alive. Had he died, the ground would have sold, the place would have closed, and, or if the brother would have been there, he wouldn't have given him nothing. He wouldn't receive him like the father. But there was two great miracles here. One, the son came home that was lost. And two, the one that stayed there finally learned about the father. Both of them began to know the father as they should. God help us to always have a door open. For people, new or old, people that's never been here can come in and find the family of God. People that used to be here can come back in and find their place in the family of God. And will kill the fatted calf and rejoice. Amen. Barbecue. <laughs> Brother Tommy. <laughs> Maybe do a brisket. <laughs> do something. People that leave God said, said they're dead, dead in trespasses and sins. But now they're alive again. They're lost in, in this sinful world. But now they're found. There's always hope. There's always hope. But if that son never decided to come home, he'd have stayed in that condition. But he finally woke up and he said, hey, I'm going home. I, I, I remember home and I love it. It's good for people to have a fond memory of the house of the Lord. Say, Lord, I'm going to go back. The Spirit of God's there. The Word of God's there. And it's never hungry. The covering of the Lord is there. The, that love, that endless circle is there. That robe is there for the covering from the Lord. The fatted calf, the word of God is there. The spirit of the Lord, I'm going to go home. Pray that people will make up their mind and, uh, and get tired. Get tired of all the sorrow and sin and sadness and failure. And wake up and say, I'm going home. I'm going back to the house of God. It was better when I was serving the Lord than when I was out here. And then for people that's never known it, what a wonder, isn't it, to have new people come in. God's going to build his family. Lord, help us to be... We don't want to be like the younger brother that just forsakes God and goes out, but we don't want to be like the older brother and begrudge anybody getting saved. Anybody that can get saved, Lord, save them. Right. We'll share what we have. Yes, God. The more, the, 
Love is like this. You give it away, you don't run out of it. You, if you kind of hoard it up before long, you ain't got any. The more love you give away, the more you have. It multiplies. So I thank the Lord. I was listening today to your testimonies, words you're saying. You know, I would that we could solve the problems of our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. I wish we could solve our own problems, Sister Alice. But only God can solve the problems. We're at a place where God can solve our problems. But when people aren't here, people that we love, and we know the answer. We know the answer to their problem. Sister Robin, we know what the answer to their problem is. And you can tell them, but it don't seem like they listen until they get down. Usually people don't come into God riding on a white horse and all... Everything's just fine. Said, I'll come to church when everything gets straight. You know, when I get everything straightened out, I'm going to come to church. And I'm thinking, yeah, that's when Ponder steps in. Everything will be straightened out. And you'll come to church for one last time. And we'll have a funeral service for you. Because you don't get things straightened out without God. You can't straighten things out by yourself out in the world. You've got to come to the house of the Lord with all your problems and all your heartaches and everything that goes with it. And God begins to work in your clay. And you stay on the wheel and after a while he removes all the sticks and the debris and everything else that's in you. That's unlike him. He begins to clean you up. We sung that song. Uh, he healed me and cleansed me. Isn't that a strange thing to sing? He healed me and cleansed me. What was the next word? Sweet peace inside. And sweet peace inside. Sure, we need to be cleaned up. There's things of, like, of carnality within us. That, that son that left, come back, he needed to be cleaned up. But the one that stayed needed to be cleaned up. He had some problems he needed to work on. So we all need God's assistance in working and Growing and developing in Him.